لا إله إلا الله الله أكبر الله أكبر ولله الحمد الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر لا إله إلا الله الله أكبر الله أكبر ولله الحمد الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته How is everyone? I pray all is well at your end Alhamdulillah So apparently today is holiday, right? Everyone is at home It is in UK I'm not sure about North America and other parts of the world It's like kind of a holiday period Right? So spring is there, alhamdulillah. Okay, it was just off on Friday. Okay. But it's like uh, sometimes uh, there are days like when children are around. Although we are in lockdown, most of, the, most, of, most of the places. But I was thinking that when, especially when the children are around, husbands are around, it is uh, challenging at times. But if we remember that if we gain anything with, with struggle and we do it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, inshallah, our reward will be multiplied. Alhamdulillah. I'm sorry about that. Um, is the volume low with everyone? Okay, I have increased volume from everywhere. Hopefully it's okay. Okay, alhamdulillah. Let's start with dua. نحمده ونسلي على رسوله الكريم أما بعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري أحل لقدة من لساني يفقه قولي رب زدني علما اللهم وفقنا لما تحب وترضى اللهم اجعل عملي كله صالحا واجعله لوجهك خالصا ولا تجعل لي أهد فيه شيئا أمين رب العالمين Alhamdulillah for another day, another beautiful day where we are going to continue our tafsir of Surah An-Nisa. Alhamdulillah. Ahlan wa sahlan marhaba. Once again, all of you and you all are precious because you are the students of Quran. And our class schedule is almost, is almost the same as usual. Um, it is in front of you. And then we will start our dua session. Are you all ready? So how is your... A routine going with morning and evening du'as. Are you trying to adopt the routine? Or you're, maybe you're already doing something, alhamdulillah, good. Are you reminding yourself on time to read your askar? So you have to like take one step ahead. So you think if you are already doing it, then add something else, right? And especially when Ramadan is coming. I was thinking when we talk about du'as and askar and we hear from our teachers and some different scholars, they really encourage us to make du'as, especially when it is the time of Ramadan. And this is the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, right? The time for the acceptance of du'as because we'll be fasting, inshallah, doing good deeds. I was thinking that we should take some practical step and we should start from now. If some of you if, uh, have uh, happened to listen to Welcome Ramadan, from uh, yesterday by Ustazah Taimiyah, it was so beautiful that uh, she said that we have to start from now. We don't have to really wait for Ramadan, so you have to start bringing change from today, right? So I was thinking um, and one, at one place I read that uh, write 10 du'as, at least 10 du'as, which you really want to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Shall we do it together today? Shall we make it our homework? What do you think? Yes, it was great. So let's write 10 du'as today. And you have to do it today after the class. Are you going to do it? Type one if you're going to do it. Inshallah. 
Okay, because I'm going to do it. So 10 special du'as which you want to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which you want your, uh, th these are like your needs, your wish, your, um, you know, really you are desperate for those, that thing you really want from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, um, either it's of dunya or of akhirah. Right? Like, for example, we all want Jannat, we all want Jannat al Fiddos, do we? And how many times we have asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala desperately that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, may Allah just, just give me Jannat al Fiddos, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you are, um, you can do anything. So make me do, do those deeds which take me to Jannat al Fiddos. Sometimes we have to ask Allah like that. Do you all agree? I know you all agree, alhamdulillah. Let's do our dua. Uh, dua number eight, alhamdulillah. This is beautiful importance of the morning and evening is Askar. Ibn Kathir said, wear the coat of Askar so it can protect you from the evils of humans and jinn and cover your soul with istighfar so it can erase the sins of the night and day. So, so beautiful. So you see, uh, one time we learned um, of another uh, person a pious person who told, uh, like, who said that uh, the askar are like the shield, isn't it? So this is like a coat of protection. So what do you think? How often we should wear this coat? Sometimes we should wear it all the times, right? All the time, throughout, right? So you see, and the more early and the more uh, uh, early we will do our askar on time that we will go. And the, under the protection of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? So there, there is evil which exists in humans and in jinn. We all know that, right? And then we all make mistakes day and night. We have to acknowledge our sins. But for that, we don't have to just acknowledge. We have to do istighfar as well, right? Ask for forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So today, dua number eight is a beautiful one. Asbahna ala fitratul islam. You can read after me. Asbahna ala fitratil Islam. You can take a pause here. Wa ala kalimatil ikhlas. Wa ala dini nabiyina Muhammadin sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Wa ala millati abina Ibrahim hanifam muslima wa ma. Or we can also say. Wa ala millati abina Ibrahim. You can take a pause here. Hanifam Musliman wa ma kana min al mushrikeen. One more time. You can mark your pauses. Uh, we can read in one go as well. But those of you who are doing it for the first time, it's always good to break down the dua. Right? So one more time. Asbahna ala fitratil Islam wa ala kalimatil ikhlas wa ala dini nabiyina Muhammadin sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. وَعَلَى مِلَّةِ أَبِيْنَا إِبْرَاهِيمِ حَنِيفًا مُسْلِمًا وَمَا كَانَ مِنَ الْمُشْرِكِينَ So what is the meaning of this dua? We enter a new morning upon the fitra, pure disposition of Islam, upon the word of pure faith, upon the religion of our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa and upon the creed of our forefather Ibrahim alayhi salam, who was one inclining towards truth, a, a Muslim that is submitting to Allah and he was not of the polytheist. So you see, this is the morning version and this is the evening version. And what has what has changed in the evening version? Just one word. Okay? This one. So asbahna has been replaced with what? Can you type? I'm saying it. Good. Barakallah. Sister Shatila. For always replying first, mashallah. And all of us can do the same. Okay, I know sometimes we think, okay, one person has replied, so let me just reserve. If you can um, reply verbally, that's fine. Although I'm not, I can't listen to you, but inshallah, your reward will be reserved. Right? Yes, I'm saying, Barakallah, Sister Nadia, Sister Farah. Okay, I'm saying, ala fitratil Islam, wa ala kalimatil ikhlas, wa ala dini nabiyina Muhammadin sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. وَعَلَى مِلَّةِ أَبِيْنَا إِبْرَاهِيمِ حَنِيفًا مُسْلِمًا وَمَا كَانَ مِنَ الْمُشْرِكِينَ So the meaning is the same except the first word. It means, Amsayna means we enter a new evening. 
I will read, I will leave the rest of the translation. Let's look at the hadith reference. Abdul Rahman bin Abza radiallahu anhu narrated from his father that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would recite in the morning and evening. We enter a new morning and evening upon the fitrah, pure disposition of Islam, upon the word of pure faith, upon the religion of our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and upon the creed of our forefather Ibrahim alayhi wa sallam, who was one inclined to restrict a Muslim submitting to Allah and he was not of the holy place. So what is the purpose of this dua? That in this dua, we are acknowledging and expressing our belief of the oneness of Allah. That is, we are acknowledging that Allah is one and we don't associate any partners with him. Right? So every morning and every, mor and every evening, it is important that we are aware and that we are grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he has made us Muslim. Islam is a ni'mah. Do, do we all know that? That Islam is a blessing? Alhamdulillah, it's the greatest blessing one can have, one can ever have. Imagine anything other than Islam, subhanAllah. And there are examples in front of us. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made us Muslims, alhamdulillah. And then we are practicing that we believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We are not just uh, Muslims by the name only, alhamdulillah. Don't we see examples around us that those, there are some people who are Muslims just by their names, but there is no concept of Allah. There is no concept of Tawheed in their lives. So this is such a greatest blessing, Alhamdulillah. And we acknowledge, so we are acknowledging this blessing in the morning and in the evening. And then we say, وَعَلَى كَلِمَةِ الْإِخْلَاسِ right? So, uh, also, if you, if you remember that our Iman will be considered complete when we will believe in the heart. And what else? So Iman is just to believe in the heart only? What, do we, what else we have to do? I mean, I mean, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide them too. We, we, yes, there's nothing to be proud of, but be, to be thankful of, to be grateful that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed us with this name and we could be one of them. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed me and yes, may Allah guide them too. Right? Yes, so Iman is depicted through actions, right? We have to express it through tongue as well. So this is, this is when our Iman will be considered complete. Right? And then when we say وَعَلَىٰ كَلِمَةِ الْإِخْلَاسِ That is upon the words of pure faith, that meaning on Tawheed. Every action should be done with sincerity to please him alone. Right? So this is also important. So by reading this dua, being grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for this morning and evening in which we are in a state of iman following the deen of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Again, acknowledging that we are on the deen of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And when we say upon the creed, when we say Millati Abina Ibrahim, what does it mean upon the creed of our forefather Ibrahim alayhi salam? That we are confirming that we are the one who follow the way of the one who was a Hanifa Muslima. Do we all know this quality of Ibrahim alayhi salam? Ansiwawi. What how do you uh, explain this in a easy word in easy words? Hanifa Muslima. So we know Muslim is the one who submit to Allah. How do you all explain Hanifa? I always take it as a focus person, right? Hanif, Yaksu, right? Very good. So he was like focused, focused on his goal. His goal was the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? He was tested hard, but he remained focused. He did not lose his focus. What is for me? I have to ask myself. So we make this dua to remind ourselves of, of our belief of Tawheed, and to keep ourselves steadfast on this belief. It's a beautiful dua, alhamdulillah. So every new morning and evening, it brings a chance to renew our intentions and restart. And this is the easy breakdown for memorization. So I want all of you to go over it. And I might take a little um, like kind of uh, test, you can say, or I will ask you uh, what is the meaning of this word. And I hope that you will figure it out, inshallah. Right? Alhamdulillah. Barakallahu feekum. Jazakum Allah khairin kathira. Inshallah, in a minute, uh, we will start with a tafsir class. And meanwhile, we will listen to takbirat. Or you can also practice these two. 
Is it okay, everyone? I'll see you at the end of the session. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar La ilaha illa Allah Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar Wa lillahi alhamd Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar La ilaha إلا الله الله أكبر الله أكبر ولله الحمد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على رسوله الكريم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي اللهم اهدي قلبي وسدد لساني واسلل سخيمة قلبي آمين يا رب العالمين إن شاء الله today we will begin from verse number 58 of سورة النساء إن الله يأمركم أن تؤدوا الأمانات إلى أهلها Indeed, Allah commands you to render trusts to whom they are due. And when you judge between people, to judge with justice. Excellent is that which Allah instructs you. Indeed, Allah is ever hearing and seeing. Now this ayah, uh, we learned that it was revealed about Uthman ibn Talha radiallahu anhu, who was the caretaker or rather the bearer of the key to the Kaaba. And when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam took the key of the Kaaba from him and entered the Kaaba on the day of, of the victory of Mecca, uh, when the Prophet ﷺ came out of the Kaaba, he was reciting this ayah. And Umar anhu said that he had not heard him ﷺ recite this ayah before. So based on this, uh, it is the understanding that this ayah was revealed upon that incident that the Prophet ﷺ had borrowed the key from Uthman anhu, and upon uh, cleaning out the Kaaba, he returned the key to Uthman. Why? Because Uthman radiallahu anhu was the bearer of the key of the Kaaba. So uh, even though this ayah was revealed regarding a certain context, remember that the application of the ayah is general. And Imam Shawkani says that this ayah is from the Ummahatul Ayat. It is from the foundational verses of the Quran because it teaches us very important premises. And this ayah addresses all people. And this ayah uh, you know, rela relates with people of authority and also every single individual. Because this ayah is, is telling us uh, the importance of, uh, or, or rather in this ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is commanding us that we must render trusts to whom they are due. And when it comes to amanat, when it comes to trusts, then this is something that applies to every single person in one way or another. So in this ayah, we see that two commands are being given. The first command is أن تؤدوا الأمانات إلى أهلها that you should render trusts to whom they are due. And the second command is that وَإِذَا حَكَمْتُمْ بَيْنَ النَّاسِ أَن تَحْكُمُوا بِالْعَدْلُ that when you judge between people, then you must judge with justice. But before these two instructions, it is made clear that in Allah يأمركم. It is indeed Allah who commands you. And right after these two instructions, it is said in Allah That indeed Allah is telling you to do something that is excellent for you. And at the end of the verse, two names of Allah are mentioned. So uh, the fact that these two commands 
uh, you know, before the commands are given, we are told that Allah is commanding us to do this. And after these commands, we are told that these are excellent commands from Allah. This shows us how incredibly important these two commands are. So what is the first one? The first one is amanati ila ahliha, that you should hand over trusts to their ahl. Now, al-amanat, this is the plural of amana. And amana, generally, it is understood as a trust. So when it is said that you, you pay up, you return, you hand over the trusts to their people, to their owners, to those who are worthy of them, this means a number of things. First of all, this means that when you when you have an amana, when someone trusts you with with their property, they they give it to you uh, to take care of it, to guard it in their absence. Then, when it is time, then you must return their property to them. So, wh whether it is that you have borrowed something from someone, or that they have deposited it with you for some time, then remember that just by uh, having it temporarily does not mean that you have become the owner. No, when, when something is with you temporarily, then when, when the time has come, then you should return that property to its rightful owner. Secondly, this also means that when you owe someone something, like for example, a payment or uh, something that you're supposed to give them, then you should give it. Uh, don't hold on to it, don't delay it unnecessarily. And then thirdly, this also means that when you must assign something, when you must assign a responsibility, because remember that amana also means a responsibility. So when you must give and uh, when you must assign a responsibility, then you must assign it to those who are its ahl, to those who are truly worthy of it, capable of carrying it not someone whom you are biased towards, someone whom you give preference to because you like them or that they are related to you or that you know they will benefit you. No, you have to see who is really worthy of carrying that responsibility. You must give it to those. So we see that this ayah, yes, it is addressing people in authority that when you assign tasks to others, then make sure you assign it to those who are who are able to fulfill those tasks. But then this also applies to every single one of us, that when we owe something, then we must uh, submit it. When we, uh, when we have borrowed something, then we must return it. Now let's look at the, the word amana. Amana is basically a thing that is committed to the trust and care of a person, meaning they're supposed to uh, take care of it. It is, you know, they have been trusted with it, so they have to guard it, and it is entrusted in their care, uh, which means that it it has not become their property. They're only temporary guardians, so they have to hand it over. They have to return it when the time has come. Now, this includes tangible things and also intangible things. Tangible things, like for example, a a property or even, for example, a car, right? That you have borrowed someone's car, you have borrowed someone's computer, you have borrowed someone's, uh, you know, dishes. Then when it is time, you must return it. Borrowing does not mean that you have become the owner, right? Uh, but then uh, the word amana also applies to intangible things. Like, for example, someone trusts you with their confidential uh, matters, Right, they're going through uh, some some struggle in their personal life. They share that with you, and they are you know they're whispering. They're making sure that nobody else is listening. So that is an amana with you, right? So an amana can also be a qawl. It can even be a statement, right? Uh, a word uh, meaning something that someone shares with you. And then amana can also apply to a task. It can also apply to an amal, an action. So for example, someone entrusts you to do something. Your parents ask you to, to go buy groceries with the money that they have given you. So this, this action is an amana on you. So uh, amana, the concept of amana is very broad. We can see from this that amana is not just about, you know, uh, someone uh, leaving uh, you know, a, a, a box of their belongings with you, uh, asking you to just keep those belongings in your in your house. 
uh, and then they will collect it later. Uh, that's not the only concept of amana. Amana has to do with the responsibilities that we are given. It has to do with the secrets uh, or, or the in confidential information uh, that has been shared with us. So uh, any breach of, you know, of, of such uh, matters would be considered khiyana, treachery. Now, when we think about amana, remember that amana is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, meaning there are those matters which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has entrusted upon us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has, uh, has given us those things uh, to do or those matters to take care of. So, and to addul amanati ila ahliha means that when Allah has entrusted you with something, then you must fulfill that trust. You must fulfill that responsibility. You owe this to Allah. And this includes, for example, salah, right? Uh, you know, for example, if you, if you neglect your prayer, uh, you know, another a person cannot penalize you. They, they will not, uh, you know, give you a fine. Uh, a, a police officer will not come and give you a ticket that how come you didn't pray on time, right? Uh, but this is something that you owe Allah. This is a matter of amanah with Allah. And it's not just to do with salah, but this includes all religious obligations, all religious responsibilities that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has, has imposed upon us. And it, it's not just related to acts of worship. Yes, acts of worship are included in this, like salah and zakat, etc. But also the other responsibilities that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us in our lives. So for example, uh, when it comes to uh, the husband's responsibility to take care of his wife, to, to provide for her, and to, uh, you know, for, for the father to take care of his children. When it comes to the responsibility of, uh, of, the, of the wife, we have learned uh, in, in Surah An-Nisa, فَالصَّالِحَاتُ قَانِتَاتٌ Right, so, uh, and then حَافِظَاتُ لِلْغَيْبِ So, uh, these are all, uh, yes, these are our relationships with people, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put us in these situations and has imposed certain responsibilities on us. Uh, because when it comes to the right of the husband, for example, or the right of the wife, uh, these rights, uh, the, uh, you know, which are given by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or these obligations, uh, the, these are not from people, these are from Allah. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has imposed these responsibilities on us, then this means that we must fulfill them uh, as, as part of being loyal to Allah. And if we are not fulfilling these responsibilities, if we are neglecting them, then yes, we are abusing people, but at the same time, we are also being treacherous with Allah. Astaghfirullah. So remember that when we, uh, when we are dealing with one another also, then this is a, a part of uh, our loyalty to Allah. Uh, secondly, uh, amana, yes, uh, uh, you know, it, the, the first type of amana is that which has, it has been imposed on us by Allah. And the second type is that which is uh, imposed on us by people. So for example, when people trust us with some information, right? Or people uh, deposit some of their belongings with us. They lend us some money, right? They lend us some property. Then uh, we have to, uh, we have to uh, be be honest over here, and and we should not be treacherous. And there will, and there are different ways of being treacherous. You know, a, a lot of times it happens that even after people, you know, sign a non-disclosure agreement, still afterwards, for the sake of some money, for the sake of some personal benefit, they will disclose confidential information, right? And as a result, individuals suffer, companies suffer. Right, so so this is this is treachery. You know, for selfish reasons, do not betray people. Likewise, between the husband and wife, there are you know certain private matters. So, uh, so uh, amana is that you don't disclose them to others. And then thirdly, amana uh, has also to do with oneself that you don't betray yourself. How by putting yourself in harm's way, by uh, by disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, by committing sin, because you are a trust with yourself. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you uh, your life, your body, your time, your, your intellect, uh, all of this as an amana to you. So uh, you have to take care of it. 
So we see from this that everything that we have basically is an amana, from the biggest things to the smallest of things. You know, for example, when it comes to our wealth, even, uh, we cannot do with it whatever that we want. So for example, we just got bored of something and we just throw it away, right? Or we just, uh, uh, you know, we're, we're feeling bored. So we just start, uh, you know, breaking things, cutting things, et cetera. No, we can't do that. Just because we can afford it doesn't mean that we can destroy our wealth because even our wealth is an amana on us. How? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to ask us on the day of judgment that what did you do with it? How did you get it? And what did you do with it? So we really need to think about the decisions that we make on a regular basis and, and become more conscious about, uh, about how we are making these, deci uh, these decisions. So everything we have is an amana. Salah is an amana. Wudu is an amana, right? The time that we have at our hands, that is amana. Our own body is an amana. Our clothing is an amana. Our house is an amana. Our children are an amana. Our spouse is an amana, right? Every part of you is an amana on you. And this means that you must take care of it. You must uh, deal with it with care, uh, with love, with due attention. And remember that amana and khiana, uh, meaning uh, trustworthiness and, and treachery, they can never be together because the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, he said in a hadith, we learn that وَلَا تَجْتَمِعُ الْخِيَانَةُ وَالْأَمَانَةُ جَمِيعًا That treachery and, uh, and um, trustworthiness can never be together. Meaning uh, either you are this way or you're that way. And this is so true that either, uh, you know, a person is very neglectful and that neglect is not just seen in one aspect of their life. It trickles into every aspect of their life or they are trustworthy, they're responsible and that trickles into the rest of their life as well. When we, uh, when we fulfill amanat, whether it is in the form of the homework that is assigned to us by our teacher, right? or fulfilling uh, uh, you know, our duties to Allah. When we fulfill our amanat, then this is a means of gaining the love of Allah and his messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Meaning this is a quality that is very admirable. And you see, uh, you also develop great respect for people who, who fulfill their amanat. Uh, in a hadith we learn, uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that if you uh, want that Allah and his messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam should love you, then you should guard three things. And uh, these three things are Sidqul Hadith, that you should be truthful in your speech. Secondly, Ada'ul Amana, that you pay up your trusts. And thirdly, Husnul Jiwar, that you should be a good neighbor. These three things will bring you the love of Allah and his messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And on the contrary, when a person is neglectful in this matter, then this is from hypocrisy. Uh, we learn in a hadith, famous hadith, that the signs of, of the hypocrite, uh, uh, you know, uh, we, we learn in hadith about the signs of a hypocrite, right? And in this version of the hadith, we learn that four things, there, there are four characteristics. Uh, whoever has them is a is a hypocrite. And whoever has one of these traits, then he has a trait of hypocrisy until he leaves that trait. He leaves that behavior. And what are these four things? They are that khana, when he is entrusted with something, he betrays. When he speaks, he lies. When he makes a promise, he, he breaks it. وَإِذَا خَاصَمَ فَجَرَ And when he argues, he, become very, he becomes very vulgar. Allahu Akbar. And khiyana is something that is uh, incredibly dangerous. We learned that al-makru uh, wal-khadi'atu wal-khiyanatu finnar. Al-makr, plotting to harm someone. Khadi'a, uh, betraying someone. Khiyana, treachery. All of these are in hellfire. And another important thing is that, you know, sometimes when certain people are loyal to us, we are loyal to them, 
right? If they fulfill their trusts with us, we fulfill our trusts with them. They fulfill their commitment, we fulfill our commitment. But then if someone betrays us, we think that we can also betray them, right? So for example, someone uh, owed us something, they never gave it to us. So the next time we owe something to them, we say, you know what, I'm going to teach them a lesson and I'm not going to give them so that they learn. And, and this is not correct. In a hadith, we learn that adil amanata, uh, that, that pay up the amana, return the amana to the one whom you owe it to. And wala tahun man khanak, do not betray the one who betrays you. And if someone cheats you, you don't cheat them, right? If someone was dishonest with you, that when they when they were supposed to return something to you and they didn't, you don't do the same to them. You trusted a, a friend with a secret, and she let it out. Now you don't go and uh, and uh, expose their secrets. You don't do that, even in taking revenge. You don't do that because khiyana uh, is something that is uh, dangerous for our spiritual health. The second command is that when you judge between people, then do so with justice. Meaning every decision that you make, especially when it is to do with people. And this could be your own children even, between your own children. Uh, or between your students, between the people whom you have hired to do some work for you, uh, then you must judge with due justice. Adl is to be just. It's the opposite of zulm, right? Meaning do not be unfair. So be just with everyone. And anytime, you know, or, or a situation where you feel that you cannot be uh, impartial, you, you, you cannot be just then do not uh, do, do not judge over there. Step away from that. Ask someone else to make a decision. Uh, so uh, especially in cases where you feel that you may be biased because it, it, you know one party is you know is someone who is who, who is related to you, uh, then in that case uh, you don't uh, take on the burden of uh, you know making judgment over there because you know you will not be able to. Uh, be fair. So, وَإِذَا حَكَمْتُمْ بَيْنَ النَّاسِ أَنْ تَحْكُمُوا بِالْعَدْلِ And you must judge with justice. And because of this, uh, you know, uh, th there is a rule that a judge cannot uh, pass judgment while he is angry. Why? Because when he is angry, his judgment is, is clouded, right? So he will not be able to make a fair judgment. So, أَنْ تَحْكُمُوا بِالْعَدْلِ and bayna nas, and nas includes all people, Muslims and non-Muslims, those who are related to you and those who are not related to you, those whom you like and those whom you have a problem with, right? Those whom you have, uh, you know, a good relationship with, and those, you know, with whom you're always getting into differences with. So a nas includes all people. Uh, we learn in Surah An Nisa, inshallah, later on we will study this ayah, ayah 135. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that Ya ayyuhalladhina amanu Kunu qawwamina bilqisti shuhada alillahi Walau ala anfusikum Which basically means that Be just, right? Even if that is against your own selves Meaning sometimes uh, You know, being just means that You're going to have to suffer Right? Awil walidain Or it goes against your parents Wal aqrabin Or it goes against some of your closest relatives. So justice is, is extremely important. And those who are just, we learned that on the day of judgment, the muqsiteen will be on the people who are just, they will be on podiums of light on the right side of Ar-Rahman. And they will be so close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on podiums of light. Allahu Akbar. And we also learn in another hadith that judges are of three types, one of whom will go to paradise and two will go to hell. The one who will go to paradise is a man who knows what is right and gives judgment accordingly, meaning he has the training. And before he passes judgment, he investigates, he hears both parties, and then he gives judgment. But a man who knows what is right and acts with injustice, then he will go to hell. So some judges, yes, they have the training, 
But then when it comes to passing judgment, they become unjust over there. Why? For personal benefit or because of the bribe that they're being offered or because of the threat that they have been given by the, by, by the criminals, right? And then the third is a man who gives judgment for people when he is ignorant. Allahu Akbar. So be careful about this as well. Because a lot of times, you know, when, when we're asked questions about divorce, about marriage, about inheritance, and these things, uh, we, we are very quick to pass judgment on people, right? Or, or, or give a fatwa, right? Based on, uh, based on the little bit that we have heard. So always be careful about this. Uh, realize that uh, giving a fatwa, passing a judgment, declaring someone right and declaring someone wrong, this requires a certain level of knowledge and training and investigation, both, right? Knowledge, training, and investigation. So if you, if you find yourself uh, unable to, uh, uh, you know, make judgment because you are lacking in either of these matters, then step away. Do not pass judgment over there. Refer people to, to someone else. Uh, and, and another thing is that even when it comes to, uh, you know, judging between your children, you know, for example, uh, sometimes your children, they have an argument, they come to you. Sometimes we just listen to one side, right? We just listen to one child, the child who is crying more or is being more loud or is better at expressing himself or who is generally obedient to us, right? So we listen to that child more and we blame the other. So we have to be careful about this. So adil is that you listen to both sides of the story. Inna Allah ni'imma ya'idhukum bih, inna Allah kana sami'an basira. What an excellent thing, what a good thing Allah is telling you to do. Meaning this is so virtuous that A, you pay up the trusts, you entrust responsibilities to those who are capable. When you owe something to someone, you actually hand it over. Uh, this is this is excellent for you. This is so virtuous, uh, what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling you to do. And also uh, the fact that uh, you should uh, judge with justice. In Allah ni'imma ya'idhukum bi. So pay attention to these two things. In Allah kana sami'an basira. Indeed, Allah is ever hearing and seeing. Now this is so relevant to what is being mentioned over here. Allah hears and Allah sees. Because, you know, uh, when it comes to amanat, when it comes to the trusts that we are given, sometimes we try to hide from people and disclose, uh, you know, a secret that was given to us to someone else. And we tell them, look, look, don't tell anyone, right? Don't tell anyone. And we whisper, Allah is Samir. Someone told you, do not tell this to anyone. And you go and tell, this, tell that to someone else. Allah heard that. The person who sh whose secret it is, maybe they don't, they don't know. They never heard. But Allah heard. Uh, Allah is Samir. Allah is Basir. He is ever seeing. Because sometimes when we owe someone something, we, uh, you know, we, we, uh, we, and, and we are betraying them. We do things, uh, you know, behind their, uh, their, their back. They, they never know about what damage we may have caused to their, their property or where we may have fallen short in, in fulfilling our, our duty, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is watching us. So what is taqwa? What is consciousness of Allah? That you remember that Allah is listening to you and Allah is watching you, so you get your act together. And you are honest and you are uh, fair in, in private and in public. Then it is said, Ya ayyuha alladheena amanu, ati'u Allah wa ati'u rasul wa ulil amri minkum. All you who have believed, obey Allah and obey the messenger and those in authority among you. Notice over here that it hasn't been said and obey those in authority. The word ati'u has not been mentioned again. Why? Because obedience to the people in authority is only when the people in authority are telling you to do what is in compliance with the command of Allah and the messenger. If those in authority are telling you to do something that is in disobedience to Allah and the messenger, then you don't obey them. So wa ulil amri, this is conditional. 
right? And this is why atiru again has not been mentioned. Because when it comes to obedience to Allah, unconditional. No matter what the command is, no matter what situation it is, you obey Allah. When it comes to obedience to the messenger, unconditional. No matter what the command is, no matter what the society says, no matter what your, <clears throat> no matter what your, uh, you know, your, your heart tells you, you obey the messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, whether you like it or you don't. But when it comes to the command of, the instruction of the people in authority among you, then you have to check, does this conform to the teachings of Quran and Sunnah? Like, for example, ulil amr, a person in authority is who? Uh, for instance, your boss, right? You, you work for them. So if they tell you that, no, you cannot pray uh, during these hours, you have to get this work done. Well, you're not going to miss your salah. You're not going to delay your salah because of your boss. You're going to stand up for yourself over there and you're going to defend yourself because obedience to people, and this is very important for us to understand, obedience to people is never absolute. Whether those people are your parents or your teachers or your uh, boss or your husband, right? No matter who it is, uh, your obedience to people will always be conditional. This doesn't mean that you're always arguing or that you're always challenging, right? You're always creating a fuss. No, it means that you're going to check first before you obey. That does this, is this something that is pleasing to Allah? Is, is this something that is acceptable to Allah? And if there is a problem, then you draw a line over there. You draw a boundary over there, no matter who that ulul amr is. And this is very important for us to understand that as people, we always have the power to say no to other human beings. You have that power. This doesn't mean that you're always saying no, no, no to others, right? And always being difficult to deal with uh, uh, or that you're always challenging others. Th that's not the point. The point is that uh, sometimes, you know, we feel very timid before certain individuals, right? And uh, we, we feel the pressure and because of that pressure, we feel like we 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 are afraid to uh, to 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 disobey them. So we 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 succumb to the pressure basically, and this happens in so many places. So as a Muslim, you must remember this, and you must put this in the heads of your children from the very beginning, especially when it comes to your girls. You must put this in their head that you never obey people unconditionally. Because there's so much abuse, right, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, in, in relationships, uh, even in workplaces where individuals are pressured into, into doing things uh, that they feel very uncomfortable with. But then, you know, they are, uh, they are also made to feel guilty that you're not going to listen to me, right? So remember that the obedience to ulil amr is conditional it is not absolute and this is so empowering uh, very very empowering that you always have the power to say no and you know studies on obedience uh, you know uh, after uh, after uh, the, the the world wars psychologists were extremely curious about how how people can listen to uh uh, you know, orders from their, uh, from, from people in authority and, and, and commit crimes, basically, because, you know, different, uh, uh, you know, for example, the, the Holocaust, right, where millions of, of Jews were, were killed uh, in, in such terrible ways, like this was very, this was structural, right? It wasn't, um, you know, random people who were coming together to, to kill the Jews. This was an entire structure where people were hired. They were trained. Uh, you know, these are police forces. This is army, uh, right? Th that they are being told to kill other human beings. What's happening here? So they actually did a, a study in, in Stanford uh, where they hired, uh, they actually didn't just hire, they, uh, they had, um, they just put an ad in the paper uh, for a study, uh, a, a prison study, basically. 
and uh, you know people came forward and, and they were given a certain reward for for participating in that experiment and they randomly assigned uh, certain individuals as uh, prison guards and other individuals as prisoners and um, it, this was supposed to be a very long study but within a few days they actually had to uh, cancel the study and and they couldn't just tell people that okay we're, we're stopping this experiment now they had to call uh, the FBI to come and um, you know stop uh, what was happening because the people who took uh, who assumed the responsibility of being prison guards the, the role of being prison guards they became very abusive very abusive and the people who uh, took the role of being prisoners, they kind of just accepted the abuse that was being committed. So uh, the thing is that there are social pressures, absolutely. Uh, but uh, as a slave to Allah, you must remember that you are uh, free of, of people in the sense that no matter what uh, violence they use against you, no matter what words they use against you, in your heart, you should know that obedience to people is, is conditional. It is not absolute. And this comes by, by recognizing the position of Allah, the position of the Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you know, in, in our lives, that uh, when it comes to obedience to Allah, absolute authority, uh, absolute obedience, uh, when it comes to obedience to the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as well, uh, absolute obedience, this is not uh, conditional. So uh, obey Allah, obey the Messenger, and, uh, and also obey those in authority among you. Now, uh, one question is who exactly are those in authority? Is it just any person who uses uh, pressure to, to force you to do things? No. Uh, ulil amr, these are possessors of amr, amr as in the power to command. Uh, so uh, it is said that this includes the umara, the leaders, and also the ulama, the scholars. So who are the umara, the leaders? These could be many. So for example, uh, you know, a, a, your boss, right? Or for example, it, it, within a marriage, the husband, uh, within a family, uh, the parents, Right? You're supposed to obey your mother. You're supposed to obey your father. Uh, when it comes to uh, you know, a, a society, depending on what the, what the structure is of the government, any, there are different levels right? of, of leaders. So uh, with, within a school, for example, you know, the teacher and then the, the, the headmaster and the principal, et cetera. So anywhere that you know, people are uh, working together, they they have some kind of a relationship. You know, there's there is always someone who has authority. Uh, so those who are in authority, uh, you have to obey them. Okay. Secondly, uh, ulama scholars, people of knowledge, meaning when they give a fatwa, when they issue a certain uh, rule, then you obey them. Why do you obey them? Because uh, if you if you don't obey them, for example, the leaders, then you need there there is going to be chaos. If every person is doing whatever they feel like, then there will be absolute chaos for organization, for clarity, for people to function. Uh, you know, for for our lives to function peacefully, we need some kind of law and order, and we must comply with that. Otherwise, our lives would be in chaos. So, for example, when it comes to traffic rules. I, I remember once um, I was sitting in the car with someone and uh, they were taking an illegal turn and their child, uh, you know, said that, mom, you should not be doing this, right? Uh, this is illegal. And the mother replied, no, nothing illegal. She, you know, uh, we only obey the command of Allah. And I was so shocked to hear that. And, and I, I spoke up over there that, you know, this is not right. These rules, uh, yes, they're not, you know, in the Quran, there's no traffic rules. However, Allah tells us that we must obey those in authority among you. So, uh, yes, 
you may be in, in a non-Muslim country, but the law of the land, as long as it does not contradict the law of Allah, then you must adhere to it. When it contradicts the law of Allah, then you don't adhere to it. Then you find out what the, you know, how you can navigate that situation. But otherwise, don't bring up this, this uh, you know, general, uh, you, know, uh, excuse, uh, you know, this excuse and generalizing that we only obey Allah and the Messenger, we don't obey people. No, you have to obey people. You have to obey for the sake of law and order. And why obey the scholars? Because they are people of knowledge. You don't have the same level of knowledge. So if someone of knowledge is telling you about something, then you listen. But remember what I mentioned earlier, that that obedience to ulul amr is conditional. In a hadith, we learned the Prophet wasallam said that the Muslim is required to hear and obey. Meaning, when you are when you are given an instruction, you hear it, then you must obey. muslim Whether it is something that he likes or dislikes. Like, for example, for you to be standing you know, stationary at a, a red uh, uh, light, I mean, this may be very annoying to you, right? You may be feeling very impatient and there's no other cars, you know, and you just want to go ahead. You dislike it, but you still have to follow. You still have to follow the rules, whether you like it or you dislike it. Uh, uh, unless he is commanded to sin. The hadith says, ما لم يؤمر When he is commanded with sin, then there is no hearing or obeying. Meaning when someone tells you, even if they are, for example, a, a person of knowledge, right? they are considered as an alim. But if they're telling you to do something which clearly opposes the Quran, then you will not listen. You will not obey. This doesn't mean that you have to create a fight and you have to uh, throw a tantrum. No, there's different ways of showing disobedience. And uh, this, uh, this form of you know, showing disobedience sometimes is necessary because this is how people get their power back. You know, uh, there's, there's different ways of, of um, uh, seeking uh, justice. Uh, one is that you resort to violent ways and the other is that you, you use nonviolent ways to seek justice. And nonviolent ways are um, far more effective than, than violent ways. So part of nonviolence is that you uh, openly disobey uh, when, when you are being told to do something wrong. So ulil amri minkum, you obey them, but this is conditional. فَإِن تَنَازَعْتُمْ فِي شَيْءٍ فَرُدُّوهُ إِلَى اللَّهِ وَالرَّسُولِ then, uh, then if you should disagree over anything, then refer it to Allah and the Messenger. Meaning if, for example, the, the Ulul Amr is telling you to do something and you say, no, I don't agree, then refer to the Quran and Sunnah. If what the Ulul Amr is saying uh, is in line with the teachings of the Quran, then you must obey. Then the, the dispute will be solved. And if what they're telling you to do contradicts the Quran, then you will not obey. And again, the, the dispute will be solved. So the point over here is that when there is a difference, when there is a disagreement, then work towards finding a solution. How do you find the solution? By going back to the basics, by referring to Allah and his messenger, meaning the Quran and the Sunnah. And uh, by doing that, you will find a solution. But if you don't work towards finding a solution, then what's going to happen? That dispute, that disagreement is going to get worse and worse. And uh, then there is violence, loss of lives, loss of property. Uh, so uh, don't let the problem escalate. Solve the problem. فَرُدُّوهُ إِلَى اللَّهِ وَالرَّسُولِ إِن كُنْتُمْ تُؤْمِنُونَ بِاللَّهِ وَالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ If you truly believe in Allah in the last day, Meaning this is a requirement of your iman, that you resolve your disputes by referring to the Qur'an and Sunnah. This is something that your faith demands from you. ذَلِكَ خَيْرٌ That is best. And this is true. When you refer to the Qur'an and Sunnah to solve your disputes, then you find the best answers. 
and it is also best in result, meaning the outcome will also be excellent for you because not only will there be unity again, uh, but also you will be rewarded. So the outcome is excellent. We learn Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in Surah Al-Anfal, Ayah 1, that وَأَطِيعُوا اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ إِن كُنْتُمْ مُؤْمِنِينَ Obey Allah and His Messenger if you're truly believers. In Surah Ali Imran 132, وَأَطِيعُوا اللَّهَ وَالرَّسُولَ لَعَلَّكُمْ تُرْحَمُونَ Obey Allah and the Messenger in order that you may receive mercy. In Surah Al-Ahzab, Ayah 71, وَمَن يُطِعِ اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ فَقَدْ فَازَ فَوْزٍ عَظِيمًا Whoever obeys Allah and His Messenger, then, then certainly he has attained a great success. And such a person is truly successful. And uh, not obeying Allah and His Messenger, this is something that leads to not only suffering in this world, but also painful punishment in the hereafter. May Allah protect us. Then it is said, Alam tara ila ladina yazumuna annahum amanu bima unzila ilayk, wama unzila min kablik. Have you not seen those who claim to have believed in what was revealed to you and what was revealed before you? Meaning, these are people who claim to believe in the Quran and they also claim to believe in what was revealed before the Quran, meaning the previous scriptures. So, have you not seen their condition? Alam tara. And remember, I mentioned this to you earlier that this expression, alam tara, this is a question, but this is to express amazement and wonder over here. That strange is the case of these people. Now, believing in the Quran, believing in the previous revelations, that itself is not strange. That is, uh, of course, uh, you know, praiseworthy. But what is strange over here is. The behavior of these people that on the one hand, يزعمون, they claim that they believe, but then on the other hand, they wish to refer legislation to Taghut. While they had been commanded to reject it. So strange is their case. Now, who is Taghut that they're going to for judgment? Taghut, uh, remember that uh, it refers to any, any uh, person or even shaitan or, uh, you know, any object uh, that, is, uh, that is given the level of, of, um, of Lord, right? Because this, this word is from Tagha, which is to rebel. So the fact is that the creation, our status is that we are slaves to Allah. So the one who rebels from that, from that status, right, and and makes himself God, right, or or uh, is declared as God, right, then such such a uh, such a being is taghut, right? It's a rebellious creature, right, and. Um, Taghut doesn't just apply to someone that is worshipped besides Allah, but also someone that is that is uh, set up as uh, uh, you know as uh, someone who has similar power or authority as as that which Allah has. So here, that is what is meant that Taghut is referring to a person uh, the, that rules that judges contrary to the judgment of Allah. Meaning they dare to issue a, a judgment that contradicts the judgment that Allah has made. Meaning it clearly contradicts the law of Allah. So for example, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has declared that uh, we learned uh, uh, earlier about how uh, alcohol is something that is forbidden. Right? And there is multiple verses that were revealed. The prohibition was revealed in stages. The Prophet ﷺ clearly declared the consumption of alcohol as something unlawful. So it's clear from the Quran and Sunnah that the, con that the consumption of alcohol is unlawful. Now, if there is a person who says, uh, uh, alcohol is all good, drink it, it's fine. Right? That, that would be what? Contradicting the judgment of Allah. Right? Likewise, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has declared riba unlawful. And someone says, it's okay, 
go ahead, take a riba-based loan. They're giving a judgment that clearly contradicts the judgment of Allah. And this is so scary because unfortunately, this has become so common, so common, especially in, in Western countries where Muslims have, they don't even realize the severity of this crime where we are taking interest-based loans, whether it is to pay for education or to, to buy how, you know, a house or a car and things like that. You know, what has happened to us? So uh, the, very strange is the case of the people who on the one hand, they say that they believe, but then they go to someone other than Allah, they go to Taghut, right? And they seek judgment from Taghut while they were actually commanded to deny it. Allahu Akbar, what's happening? You need, this is not just something that was that happened at the time of the Prophet Wasallam. This is happening now as well. Ibn Kathir writes that this was uh, regarding uh, a man from the Ansar and a Jew, a, a Jewish man. They had a dispute. And the Jewish man said, let us go to Muhammad Wasallam to make judgment between us. But the person who was apparently Muslim, he said that, no, 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 let us go to Karb. Karb al-Ashraf, who was a, a, a Jewish leader. Uh, let's go to him to pass judgment between us. Why did he want that? Because he knew the law of Islam and he knew that the judgment would not be in his favor. So he was fatwa shopping, right? He was looking for a judgment that would be uh, according to his desires, that would that would suit his desires. So he did not want to go to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Instead, he went to a he wanted to go to a different court, and we see this among Muslims as well. You know, especially when it comes to things like inheritance and things like uh, you know property law, uh, especially at the time of divorce. You know, where where people will. Uh, certain, you know, people will take uh, advantage of the law of the land and, um, and take from the other party more than what they deserve. You know, there are so many, um, you know, th there's, there's a clear anecdotal evidence of, you know, women who at the time of divorce take 50% of, of, the, of the house even though they never put a penny into purchasing that house. But because the law of the land allows that, they will just take it. They, and Islamically, they don't have that right. Islamically, when a man divorces his wife, when there's talaq, then yes, he should give something. All right? Uh, but that something does not mean 50% of his house. And, uh, he, sh and he should not take anything uh, that he gave to her back from her. So we have to be very careful because here, uh, the reason why this man went to Taghut was to avoid the law of Allah, right? To get some advantage, some, some worldly benefit that the Taghut uh, would, would supposedly give him. وَيُرِيدُ الشَّيْطَانُ أَنْ يُضِلَّهُمْ ضَلَالًا بَعِيدًا And shaitan wants to lead them astray uh, far away, I mean, shaitan wishes to lead them far astray, in dalalam barida, not just a little bit of misguidance, misguidance that is that is far, any great. This is what shaitan wants, and uh, they're they're falling into his trap. Basically, they're listening to the waswasa of shaitan. Shaitan adorns the sin for them. Shaitan makes the sin attractive. Shaitan makes it. Uh, seem so urgent and so necessary that they're willing to change the law of Allah, right? Or, or they're willing to go to someone, uh, you know, who will, who will judge contrary to the law of Allah so that they can get certain benefits. So they're falling into the trap of shaitan. وَإِذَا قِيلَ لَهُمْ تَعَالَوْا إِلَى مَا أَنزَلَ اللَّهِ وَإِلَى الرَّسُولِ And when it is said to them that come to what Allah has revealed and to the messenger, any, why, why, where are you going? Look at the Quran. Look at the Sunnah. This is what Allah has revealed. This is what the Messenger, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, said. What do they do? 
these people don't want that judgment. You see the hypocrites turning away from you in aversion. Allahu Akbar. Such people are called hypocrites. This is hypocrisy. That on the one hand, a person says that I believe, but that in practical life, they don't obey Allah. They, they do what their heart desires. They go to ta'ud. You see the hypocrites that they are avoiding the law of Allah. Yasudduna anka. Anka is referring to the Prophet ﷺ because he would also you know, pass judgment between people. So when this particular individual was, was told that let's go to the Prophet ﷺ, they said, no, 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 no. They, 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 don't, they don't like the idea of, 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 uh, of uh, you know, go, uh, using Islamic law. They want something else. And this behavior is very similar to that of the mushrikeen. In Surah Luqman, Ayah 21, we learn, وَإِذَا قِيلَ لَهُمُ اتَّبِعُوا مَا أَنزَلَ اللَّهِ قَالُوا بَلْ نَتَّبِعُوا مَا وَجَدْنَا عَلَيْهِ آبَاءَنَا When they're told, follow what Allah has revealed, they say, no, 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 we will follow what we found our forefathers doing. And just like that, many Muslims, unfortunately, their attitude is that when they're told to follow the Quran and Sunnah, they say, no, 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 we're going to do what the, what the uh, you know, law of the land, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, benefits us with. And the law of the land is not always contrary to the law of Allah. I mean, in many places, you will see that, you know, you can live as a practicing Muslim uh, in, in many parts of the world. But especially when it comes to financial matters, right, property laws, people will take advantage of uh, non-Muslim laws uh, in order to harm other Muslims or in order to uh, take certain financial advantages. The way of the believer is different. In Surah An-Nur, Ayah 51, we learn, إِنَّمَا كَانَ قَوْلَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ إِذَا دُعُوا إِلَى اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ لِيَحْكُمَ بَيْنَهُمْ أَنْ يَقُولُوا سَمِعْنَا وَأَطَعْنَا وَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْمُفْلِحُونَ that indeed the only word of the believers when they're called to Allah and his messenger so that the messenger judges between them, the only word that they say is samirna wa atarna. We have heard and we will obey. And it is those who are truly successful, which means that those who don't obey Allah and the messenger, they are not successful. They will suffer loss. And you know, this loss comes in many ways. It comes in the form of uh, difficulty in this life, no blessing, no barakah in one's earning, in one's relationships. And then uh, this loss in the hereafter is, is much, much more. So we must take account of our, our current condition. Uh, you know, we should be, we should self, uh, we should introspect, we should examine our financial decisions and see that, uh, am I doing something that contradicts the law of Allah? Am I doing something that is clearly forbidden? Am I taking advantage of other people? Uh, am, am I uh, claiming certain rights when I actually don't have those rights and I am opposing the law of Allah in this way, but I'm doing it in a so-called legal way? Any, who am I fooling? فَكَيْفَ إِذَا أَصَابَتْهُمْ مُصِيبَةٌ بِمَا قَدَّمَتْ أَيْدِيهِمْ so how will it be when disaster strikes them because of what their hands have put forth? Meaning right now, they're very happy to go to Taghut and completely avoid you, right? Uh, pretend like the law of Allah does not exist. But then what are they going to do when they fall in some difficulty, when some disaster strikes them? And that disaster, by the way, will only strike them because of what their own hands have earned. Because remember that sins bring consequences even in this life. There is musibah, there is difficulty because of the sins that we commit in this life. So uh, what's being said is that what will they do then when, when, they, when, they, uh, when, when they're experiencing some difficulty, what are they going to do? And uh, meaning when they are in need of you, right, then... Uh, then will they also avoid you at that time? Will they also go to Taghut? Then 
then they will come to you swearing by Allah. We intended nothing but good conduct and accommodation. Meaning when they want some benefit from you, when they want some benefit from Islam, from Islamic law, when they want some benefit from the Muslims, when they are uh, desperate, then they will come. And then they will try to appease you. They will try to make you happy. And they will swear oaths that, you know, like we learn in the Quran, When they meet those who believe, they say, we believe. Well, just yesterday, you avoided coming over here. You went to someone else. And now you're coming to the Prophet You're coming to the Muslims. So there are, you know, people whose ultimate goal is to just uh, seek personal gain, personal benefit, uh, worldly benefit. And wherever they find it, they go over there. They don't have any principles to live by. They're not loyal to anyone. So when they get a certain favor, a certain advantage from the Tawut, they will go over there. And when they are in desperate need themselves, then they will uh, go to the Muslims. And then they will try to appease the Muslims. And this, this was the way of the hypocrites at the time of the Prophet ﷺ, right? So it is said that they come to you taking oaths by Allah, and then they give excuses. They, they, they justify their previous crimes that, oh, we only wanted to do good. We only wanted ihsan. What is ihsan? Uh, this has been interpreted in a number of ways. But the main thing is that, you know, we just wanted to do good. We, uh, we, we just wanted, um, you know, to, to somehow resolve the dispute in a good way. We didn't want things to get ugly, right? What tawfiqa. Tawfiq means reconciliation, meaning we just wanted to uh, quickly solve the dispute uh, we didn't want things to get worse. Uh, we were looking for a solution that worked for both of us. That's the only reason why we went to the Tawut. And they have an excuse then. So what do we learn from this? That the hypocrite, uh, the, the, the person who is not a, a sincere believer, will search for uh, only that which benefits him. And uh, whether he finds it in, in the religion of Islam or he finds it somewhere else. He's not loyal to anyone. He's only uh, loyal to his selfish desire. He worships his own desire. So wherever he finds it being fulfilled, he will go over there. And then uh, another thing that's being highlighted over here is that these people, you know, uh, at one point, they completely disobey you and ignore you. And then they later on, when they need you, they come to you. And a lot of people have this kind of a relationship with Islam. That in general, they don't think of Islam. They don't think about the laws of Islam. But when they are in some difficulty, may Allah protect. But when there is some loss of life or some sudden, you know, frightening news, then instantly they think about how they can be more Islamic, right? And when they uh, are made aware of, you know, the things that need to change, they have a list of excuses for them. Oh, we can't do that. We can't change this. You know, uh, it's, it's not possible. So what is this kind of behavior? <inaudible> Those are the ones of whom Allah knows what is in their hearts. So the hypocrisy which they conceal in their hearts is known to Allah. So what should you do? <inaudible> so you turn away from them. How can you turn away from them when you don't know what is in their heart, right? Allah knows what's in their heart. You don't, you don't see inside the heart of a person. So how can you turn away from them? What is meant is that when someone's actions and behaviors reflect hypocrisy, a double standard, right? Or, or a betrayal and selfish greed and, and, and you know, being two-faced, then Remember that actions and behaviors reflect what is on the inside. As in Surah Muhammad, Ayah 30, we learn, You will recognize the hypocrites by the manner in which they speak, meaning they speak in a very rude way to the Prophet So uh, when you 
when someone deals with you in this way that, you know, until yesterday, they did not acknowledge you. And now today they're coming to you desperately crying and trying to show that they really love you and they really care about you and they have a lot of respect for you, then what should you do? Turn away from them. And turning away from them doesn't mean that you ignore them. What is meant is do not punish them. Do not take revenge from them. Do not try to discipline them over there. Do not penalize them because that's not your job. فَأَعْرِضْ عَنْهُ means do not try to punish them. Because in so many ahadith we learned that when you know, people's hypocrisy was revealed and Umar radiallahu anhu asked the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that let me, allow me, or just command me to kill this hypocrite, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would not allow him, right? Uh, so what is meant by فَأَعْرِضْ عَنْهُمْ is that do not punish them because of what is in their hearts. Because yes, it's in their hearts. They're not openly saying that they don't believe, right? So you have to deal with people based on their apparent. Now, فَأَعْرِضْ عَنْهُمْ also does not mean that you ignore them and you do not talk to them. Because right after this, there is a command that you must talk to them, right? So وَعِلْهُمْ and admonish them. How can you admonish them if you are ignoring someone as in you're not talking to them? Right? So وَعِلْهُمْ and admonish them وَقُلْ لَهُمْ فِي أَنفُسِهِمْ قَوْلًا بَلِيغًا and speak to them a far-reaching word. This is so beautiful. You see, a lot of people, they have weakness of faith. They have hypocrisy in their hearts. Why? Because of, because of the... Uh, you know, bad habits that they have developed. You know, when, when people uh, are insecure, then they feel like they have to lie all the time. They, they have to become very selfish. They have to always look out for themselves. Uh, even if that means that they have to lie and cheat and, and take what is not lawfully theirs. So, uh, you know, don't cancel people even when they show hypocritical behavior see sometimes you you see this in your own children like Yaqub alayhi salam his sons they lied to him so many times they they betrayed him right they they betrayed the trust that they were given and uh so Yaqub alayhi salam and he, he did not tell them go away from here never speak to me again no, he, he, uh, he still spoke to them. He, he still lived with them because after all, they were also his children. So sometimes, you know, the people who are being hypocritical are actually close to you. you. You can't cut off from them. They could be your own relatives. So in that situation, what are you supposed to do? You ignore them as in do not focus on punishing them and taking revenge from them. Because when you will focus on that, you are going to make them an enemy, right? And they're only going to become more distant from you. Instead, وَعِذْهُمْ Admonish them, advise them, talk to them nicely. And we see this in, in the behavior of Yaqub alayhi salam, that how even though his sons had betrayed him and they had been treacherous with him, any, uh, when, when they were going to Egypt, he advised them. Right? فَاللَّهُ خَيْرٌ حَافِظًا Allah is the best protector because they said that we will guard our brother. Right? So Yaqub salam said Allah is the best protector. So وَعِلْهُمْ Admonish them. And وَقُلْ لَهُمْ فِي أَنفُسِهِمْ قَوْلًا بَلِيغًا Say something to them that will, that will uh, go into their heart. Yani, uh, when you speak to them make sure that what you say is well thought out well composed your advice should not be random don't just take out your frustration on them don't just vent don't just keep yelling and and you know speaking your mind all the time no be very thoughtful in how you address them so that what you say to them actually impacts their heart and this is a very important thing especially for parents with teenage children right that sometimes Parents just keep talking, 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 and the children become deaf to their parents. They know how to ignore the voice of their parents, right? They will hear every other sound, but the words of the mother, 
the words of the father, completely deaf towards it. So be, be careful in how you talk to your children. Don't just talk all the time. Say what is well thought out, well composed, so that it actually reaches the heart. Think more and talk less. وَقُلْ لَهُمْ فِي أَنفُسِهِمْ قَوْلًا بَلِيغًا This also means that فِي أَنفُسِهِمْ meaning uh, talk to them in private. Advise them in private, not in public. Because if you start advising them in public, then they will feel embarrassed, they will feel insulted, and they will become more of an enemy to you. They will not listen to you at all. They'll become more defensive. So when you have to advise them, do so in private. And the same thing goes with our children. وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَا مِنْ رَسُولٍ إِلَّا لِيُطَاعَ بِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ And we did not send any messenger except to be obeyed by permission of Allah. Meaning a messenger of Allah is supposed to be obeyed, not disobeyed. Allah did not send his messengers so that those messengers are disobeyed by people. Messengers are sent with authority to command and instruct and people, their ummah is supposed to listen to them. But no one can obey the messenger except by the permission of Allah. This is so big. You see, we need tawfiq. We need that gift from Allah to be able to obey the Prophet So if you find that you are clearly disobeying the Messenger in some aspect of your life, then ask Allah for tawfiq. وَلَوْ أَنَّهُمْ إِذْ ظَلَمُوا أَنفُسَهُمْ جَاءُوكَ And if only when they wronged themselves, they had come to you, فَاسْتَغْفَرُ اللَّهَ And then asked forgiveness of Allah, وَاسْتَغْفَرَ لَهُمُ الرَّسُولِ And the messenger had asked forgiveness for them, لَوَجَدُوا اللَّهَ تَوَّابًا رَحِيمًا They would have found Allah accepting of repentance and merciful. This is so beautiful. You see, uh, none of us are perfect. Especially as we, uh, you know, learn, uh, increase in our knowledge, we we reflect on the Quran. We realize our mistakes. We realize those places in our lives where we are clearly disobeying the Messenger, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. You know, for example, in our in our previous class, I mentioned about the prohibition of, of uh, you know, wearing fake hair, right? Uh, putting hair on hair, and that could be in the form of wearing fake lashes, wigs, etc. Uh, this is something that's clearly a prohibited. Now, as you learn, you find out that you know this is wrong. So then you have two options. One option is that you become insistent on the wrong that you were doing. You come up with some kind of excuse, some kind of justification, and you stick with it. And the other is that you realize, Allah Akbar, I was I was wrong. So anfusahum, when they had wronged themselves, because when we disobey Allah and His Messenger, we're wronging ourselves. But what's the solution to that? What's the way out? At the time of the Prophet, وسلم, people would go to the Prophet, وسلم, right? Uh, uh, you know, seeking uh, judgment from him. And then they would, of course, seek forgiveness from Allah. And the Messenger وسلم, would also seek forgiveness for them. But, you know, today, uh, what can we do when we realize we have done something wrong? We need to seek forgiveness from Allah. فَاسْتَغْفَرُ اللَّهَ you, need, you have to seek forgiveness yourself first. If you seek forgiveness from Allah, لَوَجَدُ اللَّهَ تَوَّابَ الرَّحِيمَ They would have found Allah to be accepting of repentance and merciful. Allah accepts tawbah from great sins even. And Allah is very merciful. So then... Uh, what does the intelligent person do? What does a sincere believer do? When he realizes, when she realizes, I was doing something wrong, she doesn't become stubborn. She goes to Allah. She asks forgiveness from Allah. And she asks Allah, Ya Allah, make a way out for me. فَلَا وَرَبِّكَ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ But no, by your Lord, they will not truly believe. حَتَّى يُحَكِّمُوكَ فِيمَا شَجَرَ بَيْنَهُمْ Until they make you, O Prophet وسلم, a judge concerning that over which they dispute among themselves. Meaning, they can never be sincere, true believers until A, they refer to you for judgment when there are disputes among them. So what do we have to do to, to, to be true believers? That we 
uh, refer to uh, the command of Allah and the messenger, right? Whenever there is a dispute uh, that, that we have, whenever there is a difference of opinion, whenever there is a, an argument, what's the first thing we should do? Refer to Allah and his messenger. What does Allah say? What does the Quran say? What does the Sunnah say? What is the Islamic ruling on this matter? And then B, ثُمَّ لَا يَجِدُوا فِي أَنفُسِهِمْ حَرَجًا مِمَّا قَضَيْتَ Then they do not find within themselves any discomfort from what you have judged. The second thing is that in our hearts we should have no discomfort about the judgment of Allah and His Messenger. Meaning, if we find out that this is the ruling concerning this matter, right, then in our hearts we should not find any discomfort that, oh, why... How, how could this be? This is so unrealistic. This is so impractical. You know, this is so ancient. No, we don't find any discomfort in our heart. And then they submit in full willing submission. So this is a test. You know, this ayah presents to us a test of iman. You want to check what your level of iman is? Check yourself in light of this ayah. That first of all, whenever there is a problem, whenever there's an issue, any issue in your life, where do you seek the solution from? And secondly, when you find out about the ruling, the Islamic ruling on a certain matter, then what's the state of your heart? And then thirdly, what do you actually do? Do you surrender or do you not? So there has to be inward and outward submission both, not just external submission, but internal submission as well. And not just internal submission, external submission as well. This is a test of faith. And if we had decreed upon them that kill yourselves or leave your homes, they would not have done it, except for a few of them. Meaning, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not commanded us to do such difficult things, right? Uh, Allah has not asked us to kill ourselves, right? Or to leave our homes. Uh, and if Allah had given this command, very few people ha would have done it. Uh, so uh, the, the, the message over here is that, uh, you know, the, the commands of Allah are, are very logical, very practical. But some people, even if they're, you know, uh, commanded to do something simple. They, their wicked nature is such that they dispute the orders that Allah has given. But if they had done what they were instructed, it would have been better for them and a firmer position for them in faith. Meaning if they obeyed Allah and his messenger, that would be much better for them. And remind this, and, and remind yourself of this, that in obeying Allah and in obeying the messenger, there is goodness for me. This is, this is stronger in certainty for me. This will strengthen my faith and this will, uh, this, this, this will be a confirmation of my faith. And then we would have given them from us a great reward. Allahu Akbar. Obedience to Allah and the Messenger brings great reward. And we would have guided them to a straight path, meaning the paths to knowledge and action would be open to them. When you obey Allah in one matter, then obeying Him in another matter becomes easy. Because one good deed leads to another good deed. But when we choose to disobey, then obeying uh, Allah in other matters also becomes difficult and one sin leads to another sin. And whoever obeys Allah and the messenger, then those will be with the ones upon whom Allah has bestowed favor. Those who obey Allah and the messenger, then such people will be with الذين أنعم الله عليهم. And who are Alladina An'am Allahu Alayhim? Whose uh, whose way of life, whose path we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide us to. Sirat Alladina An'am Ta Alayhim. Who are they? They are Mina Nabiheen, the Prophets, was Siddiqeen and the truthful, was Shuhada, uh, Siddiqeen, steadfast affirmers of truth, was Shuhada, the martyrs, was Salihin, the righteous, 
and excellent are those as companions. What does this ayah mean? That every person who obeys Allah and obeys the Messenger to the best of his ability, given the circumstances that he's in, then what will happen? And whether it's a, it's a man or a woman, a child or an adult, independent or dependent on others, regardless, whoever obeys Allah and the Messenger, then look at their final outcome. They will be with those whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pleased with, whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has favored, the prophets and the righteous that are mentioned over here. And وَحَسُنَ أُولَٰئِكَ رَفِيقًا uh, this doesn't mean that they will be uh, equal in rank. What this means is that they will enjoy their company. They will benefit by, by looking at the prophets of Allah, by sitting with the prophets of Allah, by meeting them, eating with them. Allahu Akbar. The final dua of the Prophet وسلم, before he passed away was Allahumma rafiqul a'la. And he also said, Because to be with such great people, this is the best companionship. You see, Rafiq is a companion in traveling, meaning someone who is with you when you're traveling. So in this journey of life, they followed the path of the prophets. They obeyed the Prophet of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So it was as though they were in the company of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in this life. So Rafiq is a companion in traveling and also afterwards, after the journey. So this life you spend with the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, by obeying him. So in the hereafter, imagine Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will put you in the company of the best Allahumma ja'alna minhum. So what do we learn from this? We learn that when there is a command from Allah and His Messenger, then we should obey. And we should pay due regard to the command of Allah and the command of the Messenger. And Islam is about complete surrender. This is not about, you know, first analyzing logically, does this make sense to me? And does this really benefit me? Uh, yes, you should use your intelligence to understand and to reflect but just because you, you find an apparent obstacle, don't think that the law of Allah is not good for you. It is good for you. And don't just look at your present condition. Realize that this is just, you know, this life, this world is only a fraction, a tiny percentage of your existence. Because the hereafter is eternal. ذَلِكَ الْفَضْلُ مِنَ اللَّهِ وَكَفَى بِاللَّهِ عَلِيمًا That is favor from Allah. That is the bounty from Allah. What is that a person is able to obey Allah and the messenger in this life and then be in the best company in the next life? This is purely Allah's favor. That a person is able to obey Allah and the messenger. That a person is able to do good things. That a person is able to stay loyal to Allah and his messenger. ذَلِكَ الْفَضْلُ مِنَ Allah. Ask Allah for this fadl. Allahumma inni as'aluka min fadlik. Wa kafa billahi alima. And Allah is sufficient as all knower. Yani Allah knows your condition. Allah knows your condition. So sometimes we put uh, you know, obstacles for ourselves. We hinder ourselves. We make this uh, you know, judgment that I can't do this. At least try. Give it a try. Allah knows your condition. Allah knows your struggle. And when Allah has given this command, knowing what people are, you know, what, what, what challenges people will be facing, do you doubt Allah's knowledge and wisdom? Allah is sufficient as all knower. So trust Him. And also, this means that Allah knows uh, who deserves guidance and success. So ask Allah for tawfiq. Inshallah, we will conclude over here. Uh, I will take any questions from you uh, in the few minutes that we have. Barakallahu feekum.
Okay, good question. You know, sometimes children ask that, why do, Why is it that, you know, women have to s stand behind the men in Salah, right? Um, you know, depending on the age of your child, you can, you can give an appropriate answer. If, if this is a teenager that is asking, or someone who is a preteen even, you know, they are very much aware of, um, you know, um, how uh, boys can sometimes behave towards girls, um, you know, and you can you can refer to that, that, you know, if, if girls were praying in the front, then boys would be harassing them, they would they would be bothering them, you know, you can use language that is appropriate for them. Um, but ultimately, what you want to teach your children is that, uh, you know, you you encourage the, the thinking. So you say good question, and you answer that. But then every single time you say that we do what Allah and his messenger have commanded us to do, because that's the main thing that matters. Because whether we understand the reason or not, ultimately, we hear and obey. So while it's good to understand the wisdoms, our obedience is not dependent on knowing the wisdom. In, in Nafil prayer, you can, you can recite any surah. Um, uh, in the case where the man is not giving anything after the divorce to a woman, can she then fight for 50%? You see, uh, what do you mean by not giving anything? Uh, is it that he is not giving uh, what is legally hers, uh, like the money that she owns, uh, or the things that she purchased with her own money, uh, what she contributed to uh, the the ownership of the house. Uh, if if that is the case, then yes, you you fight for your right. But if this is a way of getting some money out of him, um, that is not correct. Uh, in the case where. Um, you know, where a person realizes that the, the loan that they took was unlawful, then, you know, the first thing is that you acknowledge your mistake before Allah. Tawbah begins with acknowledgement that, Ya Allah, Valam tu nafsi. I have wronged myself. I, I have made a mistake over here. I should not have done this. I made a mistake in my ignorance, in my foolishness, in listening to my desires. Whatever the reason was, I have wronged myself. The first step is that you acknowledge your mistake before Allah. And then the second step of tawbah is that you feel regret, that you don't feel happy about the mistake that you made. So subhanAllah, sometimes we'll, you know, people will, for example, buy a house like this, and then they will, uh, you know, have a party inviting everyone and, you know, celebrating, uh, you know, taking pictures, posting online, you're celebrating a sin? Seriously, this is not Tawbah, this is not remorse, right? So there should be remorse. And then the next thing is that you ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Ya Allah, I want to get out of this open a way for me, create a way for me. You you keep asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to create a way for, me, for you. And you make a, an intentional plan, right? You think about how you can bring yourself out of that situation. Remember, وَمَن يَتَّقِ اللَّهَ يَجْعَلْ لَهُ مَخْرَجًا The person who obeys, uh, the, the person who fears Allah and wants to avoid sin, then Allah will make a way out for him. So uh, you figure out, you go, uh, uh, you know, you, you, you discuss with your family, you, you find out how you can get a halal loan, for example, or how you can get out of that loan, uh, even if that means you may have to suffer some, some, some financial loss, uh, you know, immediately. But don't just think about right now, right? Think about your future, your akhirah. Keep that in mind. Because وَمَن يَتَّقِ اللَّهَ يَجْعَلْ لَهُ مَخْرَجَ وَيَرُزُّقْهُ مِنْ حَيْثُ لَا يَحْتَسِبْ And Allah provides him from where that person does not even imagine. And I can tell you a number of stories, right, of, of people whom I have personally known, right, who, who realized they had taken a haram loan, they left it. 
they literally left it. From being homeowners, they became renters. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, gave them something even better. Even better. So you have to put your trust in Allah. It's hard. And it's extremely hard to get your family on board. But you keep talking, you keep you know, discussing this matter nicely with them, with your best akhlaq. And you keep begging Allah that, Ya Allah, bring me out of this. I don't, I don't want to be living this life of clear disobedience to you. Can you inherit from non-Muslim parents? Uh, uh, you see, what is meant by someone not inheriting from a non-Muslim is that you do not apply the law of inheritance to a non-Muslim. The Islamic law of inheritance is for who? It is for Muslims. Okay, It is not for non-Muslims. So for example, you as a Muslim cannot claim from your siblings at the death of your parents that me as the only daughter or as the only son, I deserve this much share of their estate. No, you can't say that. You cannot apply Islamic law in this situation. All right. However, if they do give something to you, they leave something for you in their estate, in their will, uh, of course, it will be legally transferred to you. But the the specific portions that have been fixed in Islamic law, they do not apply in this situation. So you cannot demand that, you know, my share, my share is a third, my share is a half, my share is a sixth. Uh, that that's irrelevant over here. But if they, you know, if a non-Muslim gives you something, leaves something for you, it is your legal property. Okay. Is it okay? Uh, for a man to say to his wife that I am your husband and you have to follow my orders. Um, any, you see, a husband and wife should be friendly and loving towards each other. And a man should not boast about his authority or the position that Allah has given him and you know, belittle his wife uh, in this way. And if there's something that he wants his wife to do, he can ask her, khalas. And if she says no, because I don't agree with it, I don't think this is fair, or I don't think this is Islamically correct, then that's okay. You need figure out the, the difference. Uh, work like adults, right? Uh, solve the problem like two adults. No need to um, become bossy like children do. Um, you know, figure it out, resolve the dispute in, in a responsible, respectable way. Um, not to recite Quran at Fajr and Maghrib and sit with your teenage boy because he's not studying. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Any if, because sometimes what happens is that, uh, you know, as, as a parent, we don't uh, realize where we may be neglecting our children. So if, you know, your husband says that, I, I think you should be sitting with with our son right now because he's not doing his homework and if you start doing your own thing then children will get neglected um, that's fine he's 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 pointing you towards something uh, that is necessary so you can sit with your son uh, to make sure that he does his work and you can also read something at the same time and then later on you can recite the quran any uh, reciting the quran at fajr and maghrib is not uh, an obligation if he were to say that do not pray because then you can't be with the children. No, then you will not listen, right? And another thing is that don't turn everything into an argument, into a matter of ego. Uh, you know, smile, laugh, uh, you know, make a joke uh, and move on. Um, uh, inshallah, uh, the fake hair uh, part we can discuss another time now because that's a, a slightly lengthy topic uh, if if it comes up again i will uh, mention in more detail inshallah uh, inshallah we will conclude over here subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik ashhadu an la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk wassalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh wa alaykum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Walaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Jazakallahu khairan kaseera. Jazakallahu khairan kaseera. Alhamdulillah. So, 
I know our time has gone a little longer, but it's okay. We are just here to listen to our star students' names, right? Are you all excited? And I must acknowledge that all of you are doing very well, mashallah, in your quizzes. Alhamdulillah. It shows that how alert you are in taking your notes. Because most of the students are gaining 100%. Alhamdulillah. So I'll not take much of your time, inshallah. Bismillah. We've got superstar students who have gained 100% in their quiz. Their name is Sister Malaika Qureshi, Sister Shakila Ali, Sister Rehana Parveen, Sister Uruj Ahmad, Sister Samin Azma, Sister Farah Abid, Sister Noon Siddiqui, Sister Shama Imtiaz, Sister Bibi Hajra, Sister Reshma Jabeen, Sister Huria Amreen, Sister Zulekha Bharadia, Sister Zeenat Hakim, Sister Ruksana Daula. Mashallah, Tabarakallah. And then we've got star students who have gained 80% to 99.9%. And uh, they are Sister Yus Saima Yusuf, Sister Sabra Bushama, Sister Nadia Ansari, Sister Farisa Safir, Sister Hiba Ismail, Sister Manal Zubair, Sister Amina Bilu, Sister Masarat Misbah, Sister Asia Homera, Sister Asra Jibin, Sister Seema Azam, Sister Neti Fiona Osman, Sister Shabnam Aslam, Sister Yusra Samar, Sister Amina Irfanullah, Sister Tamkina Afreen, Sister Amreen Shiraz, Sister Shakira Malik, Sister Samira Ahmed, Sister Mamoon Akhtar, Sister Sufia Kandokar, Sister Nadira Banu, Sister Samaya Muhammad, Sister Shahnaz Lafir, Sister Miriam Laida. MashaAllah. Barakallahu feekum. Jazakum lukhin kaseera. For being an amazing group, MashaAllah. Tabarakallah. Take good care of yourself and... Um, I hope that uh, we all will prepare for Ramadan well, spiritually, mentally, inshallah, and physically, right? Uh, yes, Sister Seema, you can look at Al Huda online website. You will get more details, inshallah. Barakallahu feekum. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept it beautifully from all of us. And I'll see you, inshallah, next week. Let's say dua together. Subhanakallah wa bihamdika. Shadu an la ilaha illa anta. Astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu.